welcome. It is really nice to see everybody. We pulled this together in about three seconds um, and didn't give people a lot of notice, but we're really excited that you're here because we have something very special we want to share with you and we want you to um, share your thoughts with us. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just, um, I'm going to do an introduction about TTF and this project, but I do want to go around the room um, since we don't have a huge group, which is great. Um, so um, let's just do this popcorn style. So what that means is pass it on to somebody else. It doesn't have to be anybody that you know, it can be someone you don't know, um, just so we all get to meet each other. Um, and um, TTF staff should go next. So Susan, do you wanna um, jump in? Hi everyone, I'm Susan Voltz. I'm the community organizer at TTF and I will popcorn to Dorian. Hello everyone, I'm Dorian De Angel and I'm the community watershed leader for TTF. And I will pass it on to Ellen. Thank you, Dorian. I'm Ellen Schultz. I'm with the Fairmount Waterworks and the Alliance for Watershed Education. And I'm happy to be here. I love Victoria's work. I'm a big fan. I'd like to pass it on to Lauren. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Fultz. I'm with Lehigh Gap Nature Center and the Alliance for Watershed Education. Um, and I will pass it on to Linda. Hi everyone, I'm Linda Cairns with the Center for Aquatic Sciences. And I will pass it on to Patricia. Or maybe I'll pass, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, I haven't used Zoom on my phone before and it's confusing me. <laughs> I'm Patricia. Uh, I'm with Friends for the Abbott Marshlands, which works with the Tulpahacki Nature Center. Thank you. Oh, and I need to pass it on to Dorian. Oh. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, no? I, I already spoke. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. So, Victoria, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'll go. Um, I'm Victoria Prizia, and uh, my company is Habitech, uh, and I've been working um, with Julie and Susan and Dorian on this project for the last year, but I've worked with Ellen um, uh, for years and years now, and, um, and actually, Patricia, I haven't met you, but I've been working with Kelly and Jen um, at the Tulpahaken Nature Center over the past year as well. Um, in envisioning, uh, you know, the, the next iteration of the center. So, um, yeah, it's nice to meet you uh, on this call. Yes, um, Victoria, I saw your uh, presentation and I'm amazed by your work. So I'm excited for this call. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, it's such a great project. Um, yeah. Victoria, will you pass on to somebody next? Oh yes, and I will pass it on to Jamie. Hello, everyone. Really glad to be here. My name is Jamie McRae. I'm director for the Alliance for Watershed Education, and I will pass it on to Rosa. Hi, everybody. I'm Rosa Mannion. I'm a landscape architect with uh, NB5 and just an interested party. Are there more to pass it to or did we all go? I think that's everybody. Is that everybody? That's everybody. That's great. Okay. Um, all right. And Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. It is nice to meet you. Of course. <laughs> it is wonderful to be here and see what's going on. And, you know, I feel like I, I do a lot of Zoom meeting jumping, unfortunately, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to the time where some of the meeting jumping will actually be in person. <laughs> that will be very nice. Um, so we are really excited to talk about this Learning Trail project with you. What we're looking at um, right now is Juniata Park and the, the place where up on the left, um, is the largest combined sewage outfall in the city. That's T14. Um, when it rains in Philadelphia, combined sewage comes out of that enormous 
um, outfall, which is the former Winga Hawking Creek. Um, so just you can see, you know, where you are there. This is the beginning of the I and Ramona Trail. Um, and we're going to be talking about the area down towards the bottom, which is the Furco Playground. Um, this is where the creek flows um, through the Juniata Golf Course and where it becomes the Frankfurt Creek. So just so you know sort of what we're looking at there. So um, the TTF is um, our, our mission is to connect our communities to their creeks. That's what we focus on, connecting our watershed residents to their creeks. Um, and we do that through education, stewardship, restoration, and advocacy. And um, we do all those things all across our watershed, but because of um, geography and demographics and history and all those things, um, you know, some of the work that we do in our Montgomery County communities is a little different than what, we, what we're able to do in the city. And some of what we do in the city is a little different than what we do in our Montgomery County communities. So, um, you know, one issue in terms of connecting people to their creeks is that in Philadelphia, our creeks were, our tributaries were all piped and put in culverts. So that makes it challenging to connect people. Um, in our Montgomery County communities, even though the creeks are still impaired, there's a lot more opportunities to see them and to do restoration. Um, our focus in Philadelphia is to Coney Creek Park and green stormwater infrastructure um, as a way to solve our combined sewage and runoff problems. And um, we have, have been funded by the Philadelphia Water Department for 10 years for this work. So that involves community engagement, programs, capacity building, um, all of those things in a, a park that is a total of 300 acres. The Wissahickon is 1,500, so that gives you a little sense of how small it is. And half of the park itself is the Juniata Golf Course. Um, there's a circuit trail that runs through this creek, through this um, park system, um, and it begins at Cheltenham Avenue. Um, it's a 3.2 mile trail to this spot. It will be connected to the Frankfurt Creek Greenway and to the Delaware Trail, which is very exciting. Um, and we are hoping to connect to Cheltenham at some point to sort of give you the big picture um, of that. Um, Dorian and Susan um, and one other staff position focus on our work for community engagement with this park. We've done some really wonderful things that some of you guys are familiar with. Um, some things through the Alliance for Watershed Education, um, some before that, and we are always looking for opportunities to partner to bring resources to these communities. Um, the, um, these are the zip codes that we focus on are 19120 and 19124, which surround the park. These are communities that are largely Spanish speaking, communities with really limited resources, a lot of health challenges, you know, a lot of um, challenges in terms of educational resources. Um, and we, you know, we have been successful and I'll have a lot more to do. Um, and again, bringing resources and partnerships to this park um, and the communities is what we have been um, focused on. We are at the beginning stages of a master plan for this park. Um, so I think that that, um, this is a very important time for us in terms of these kind of opportunities. Victoria, did I leave anything out? No, you didn't, Julie. That was great. Okay. So I'm going to... Um, you want to just introduce the, the fly through? Yes. So now we're going to transition. We have this very cool flyover, fly through of this site. Um, so we're going to do that. And then Victoria will take over and talk about this wonderful opportunity um, to bring some incredible educational resources to this, to Juniata Park um, and to Cayuga Street, where we spend a lot of time. Next time we'll add some sound.
worried that I didn't say this, but right up there where T14 is, that is the entrance to, to that's one of the gateways to Tacona Creek Park. That's the southernmost gateway or the easternmost gateway, one of those. Great. And so, Dorian, you're going to pull up the other PDF. So that's a fly through um, that we did, um, which basically culminated uh, some of the work that we've been doing over the last year. Um, the William Penn Foundation um, the, came to me after the River Alive um, exhibition opened at the Independent Seaport Museum, and they were interested in um, taking some of the messaging and the digital assets um, from River Alive, which is um, a 5,400 square foot exhibition that opened at the Seaport Museum uh, in 2018, and um, to repurpose that um, and create an uh, uh, engagement um, experience outside in this general neighborhood. And so when we talked through the initial kind of goals um, from a William Penn perspective, I immediately was like, Julie and the and TTF watershed and that this is a this is such a wonderful possibility for collaborating. And Julie and Dorian and um, and then Susan joined the team uh, shortly after that. Uh, we um, immediately started working on this. Um, in early 2020. Um, so we ended up getting funding late 2019 um, and uh, began this project February uh, 2020 and thankfully had um, some community meetings. If you wanna go to the next slide, um, Dorian. Um, and the community meeting was um, really connecting with uh, some of the families that Julie and her team engage with and um, we brought them to River Alive and I don't know if you know everyone here knows the exhibition but there's a classroom within the exhibition space and my the vision for that was that we could really have these wonderful meetings and presentations and other gatherings there while the exhibition's being activated by visitors and it worked perfectly um, and thankfully we got in right before COVID um, hit and and had these meetings, which allowed us to actually continue with this project. If we hadn't had those meetings, it would have been very difficult. So this is the general area, our focus area, um, and it's the area around um, at Juniana Park. And the goal, um, we can go to the next slide, uh, Dorian. Um, the goal was to um, really build on some of the work that's already begun there, as Julie was just mentioning. Um, so a lot of the stormwater infrastructure work and um, other outreach programs, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, and uh, to, to see this as a, as a way that, um, you know, we're really continuing with what has been started um, and reinforcing it with interventions that would um, directly uh, target uh, the youngest audiences, so ages three to five and their first teachers. Uh, their first teachers being, you know, potentially caregivers, um, you know, parents, uh, other relatives, older siblings, um, and that this um, learning trail would really uh, cultivate conversations about the watershed. So um, River Alive is about the Delaware River watershed um, with a lot of engaging activities um, that um, reveal some of the hidden um, stories throughout the watershed from mountains to confluence with the ocean. Um, and so in this case, we were trying to build on that, but we wanted it to also be active. And many of you know, um, having these kinds of interactivities in the public sphere is, um, is quite a challenge, uh, but we think we, we we came up with a good solution. If we can go to the next slide, Dorian. So uh, we basically broke it down into, um, okay, how can we invite people? So, so one of the goals um, for this project overall was to just basically intersect with people where they are. And so um, Dorian and Susan, um, they went out and they uh, really did a bunch of field work for us in the beginning and looked at where the stormwater infrastructure elements were, looked at just traffic patterns, you know, where are people walking
talking to? What are they doing? You know, where were some of the main, um, you know, assets for the neighborhood that, you know, people would go to on a daily basis, just really trying to understand this traffic flow. Um, and then they documented it um, and, uh, Dorian's a wonderful photographer, and um, we also documented the community session um, that we had. So with the community, we were really trying to understand this space, um, how people move through it, and what are some of the challenges or um, opportunities um, to activating it? How do they use the space now, but how would they like to use the space in the future? Um, and so that community session was very lively and, um, and very insightful. And we had um, you know, multiple families there with different age children with them. And we heard from everybody and we documented it and we had a really large map and we um, you know, really got to, I think, understand understand um, you know what are some of the issues and some of the big issues are that um, you know people weren't really families weren't really using the park um, because it wasn't very welcoming and so but then we also heard lots of ideas which is great um, for ways of activating it and things like sculptures art um, challenges activities that families could do together with multi-generations um, uh, other feedback uh, um, of just um, not having places to sit um, that, uh, you know, in terms of safety um, with, you know, um, walking there and, um, and then again, just being invite invited invited um, in a way to to use the park, and then also making use of the assets that are there there in the summer, there's a water park there. So um, just on the other side of what you can see here. So we kind of put all that together um, and we started to imagine, you know, what could this really look like? Um, and I'll just, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, Dorian. And so these are different locations we were trying. And, and the idea is that we would really create a trail. So something that you could walk along and walk along on your way to the grocery store or on your way to you know, the next thing, um, but that this would become part of the um, you know, kind of fabric of the, of the neighborhood um, and community. And so um, we broke it into uh, four different elements. And I'll walk you through each one of those. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so overall, uh, this gives you a sense of, of the pieces. So right, you saw that there are multiple crosswalks that kind of lead you to Juniata Park. And believe it or not, it took us over a year um, to work with Street's department um, to uh, get them to approve um, two crosswalks two crosswalk murals. We were hoping to have more, but we'll take two. And the idea is that the crosswalk murals will be an invitation, you know, to walk over to the park, um, which, you know, sometimes in a busy day, um, you don't even think how much nicer it would be to walk through the park to get to A to B instead of, um, you know, on it, through another path. So the, we see the um, crosswalk crosswalk murals as a um, an upliftment and enlivenment um, and they chose a certain um, style which we'll see in a minute so now that's our threshold um, anticipation come you know fun jump through the you know water bubbles um, across the crosswalk get to Juniata Park and then we'd have those six stops which you saw um, in the floor plan and each stop is essentially made up of these components which you can see in this slide and um, if you um, can just look at you can't see my can you put your cursor um, uh, Dorian around the sculpture so one of our goals was, was also to really have this project sprout from the community. And, and we you know, started that with the community session, but then we um, also worked with Jay Coriano. And some of you may be familiar with the murals that um, he worked on with TTF Watershed this past summer, which were just marvelous. And, uh, but even more than his artwork, he's marvelous. He's a, a dynamic, um, really engaging, uh, person and um, thoughtful and deep and um, and fun and uh, and so he's just a, a and he has an incredible following 
in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Julie, but he's a wonderful person to work with. And so we did want to continue the work with him. And so he did a rough sketch of the fox. So the, the idea um, that came out of the work with the community sessions was that people would really like to know more about the animals that live in the park, in and near the park. And so we were really using um, in these sculptures animals as a jumping off point. Um, at, at to, you know, greater discovery. But so he basically, um, so we'll have six different animal sculptures, but each one is a special water feature. Um, not only, so each one will have a custom water element and that water feature would be activated either naturally through rain or it can also be activated through um, young people or older people pouring water um, on the sculpture. Um, so uh, just to remind you, we are looking at these three to five year olds. So everything is of that height and safety. And um, so that a lot went into um, engineering um, which I won't bore you with, but um, just trust me, a lot of work went into engineering this. Um, and the idea is that we would take Jay, Jay would do a whimsical sculpture study. Um, if you go to the next slide, Dorian, we can, um, uh, ne the next, and the next one. So this was Jay's um, study. And then we took that to a fabricator and um, turned it into a 3D model um, and something that we could actually build. Um, and so it had various iterations, you can tell. But um, the idea, uh, in this case, we used a, um, a pup, a, a younger, um, a, a, a younger um, version, but um, the the sculpture, this animal sculptures will be developed in the next phase of work, the other five, but we use this as our um, kind of our framework in terms of like, how could we come up with this process? How could we actually make it happen? And then how could we make it safe um, to actually install it? So it's a semi-permanent uh, installation. Um, it's something that we would um, inset some uh, as a system where the sculpture kind of fits into um, the, a cement block that we would um, install. And so, so much of this was just, you know, working with Parks and Rec and really understanding what were some of the opportunities. So this sculpture, um, you can see, will have this water spout um, and, and then each sculpture has its own own um, animal song, um, which is written by Beth Gebhardt. And, um, and so the, the animal song gives a voice to each one of the, of the animals. And if you could back up, um, Dorian, and go back to the bench. So um, one of the things that we heard um, very loud and clear was um, just this idea that there's no place to sit. So if they were even, even going to go into the park, um, that there wasn't, wouldn't be a place. So we created um, a, you know, kind of a, uh, version on the ticket, uh, our own version of the Adirondack chair, um, and uh, but made it so that you could sit with multiple people on it, and that each of these benches. So in addition to six sculptures, there would also be six benches um, uh, placed along this trail, and that each bench would have a set, um, multiple sets of graphics, and that those graphics could be changed out. Um, if you keep going, Dorian, we can get to the graphics so we can give people a sense of those. Um, and again, here, oh, this is the Fox song, um, but uh, I'll just quickly read it. And did you know that foxes like to have fun? If you leave your shoes outside, they might just decide to borrow one. Same for that rubber ball you leave in the alley or that doll still sitting on your stoop. Looks good to me, the vixen might think. And soon with quick thinking and quiet pause, she'll claim whatever you've left behind and carry it back to her cubs. Um, and then on the plaque we have here, Ma says, and inside the breeze beneath the trees by the murmur of the creek, the long soft chew of an old man's shoe is mine. I rise, I dance, joy is. And this is just giving you a sense of these songs that we're imagining will start to become things that, um, you know, the young people will repeat um, and want to read over and over again. And, and this is just a, a sample. Um, so those are, so essentially just to go back, there's a lot of little components, but there's the sculpture, there are plaques um, that kind of create a footprint for the sculpture. Um, those plaques have our fox song and kind of a, um, a little fox story, uh, which could be built upon with different programs um, that Susan and Dorian will be um, you know, helping to master, mastermind. Uh, and then um, if you can go to the next one, we then take that further and we have each 
Finch um, system will have one animal sign um, and one watershed sign. And the animal sign um, will have three different uh, variations. Each one will target th the three-year-old, the four-year-old, and the five-year-old. And each sign has activities and, and conversation prompts. Um, but it's really, you know, it's really lovely um, in terms of, you know, asking you know, if foxes get wet, they might get too cold and their fur can lose oil, which protects them and keeps them healthy. And then we ask, we invite people to think like a fox and, and to um, have questions that will have them build some critical and creative thinking skills. And we've worked with an education specialist, um, Karen um, Lefkowitz, and she came up with a matrix. And so we're really tying all of our signage and our words and our um, activities and our prompts um, to help build those early literacy skills um, that we're trying to reinforce with this project. And you can see that we're really also trying to build um, some just basic knowledge, like kids five and up, um, real information plus imagination equals how kids learn, um, you know, and, and giving parents tips, give some information and listen to how they solve a problem in their own way. And so many of these things are open-ended. Um, if we go to the next sign, we'll get a second um, animal. Um, Here's our fish, um, you know, start a conversation. This is really focusing on three um, kids, three, three years and up. Action and imagination um, is how kids learn. So there's a, a, now a little differentiation. So in the five-year-old, it's information and imagination. Here it's action and imagination is how, how kids learn. Um, and our tip is suggest something, pretend to suggest something for them to do, to pretend to do, inspire the child to use their energetic body and imagination to express their ideas. So, you know, these are prompts that we're um, imagining become starting points for conversations and, um, and these fun, um, you know, discovery walks uh, that we're um, hoping that will help set the foundation for. And then um, on the left side of the bench or the right side, if you're sitting on it, then we have, um, information about the watershed. And each one of those um, will have kind of a sensory prompt. So where the um, animal um, signage is um, a little more action-based and, um, and encouraging you to um, imagine and to pretend um, and some kinesthetic you know, action. In, in this case, the watershed information is basic, um, and, um, but it's also providing some inspiration for sensory um, reflection. So in this case, we're saying, what are all the colors you see in the river? Um, these are things that you know, we're really hoping will become part of their walk. Um, and of course, you know, the big goal is, will they step into Taconi Creek Park? And when they're passing the creek, you know, wouldn't it be lovely if the four-year-old then really did look for all the colors in the, in the creek? Um, and so we have one more sign as a sample to show. Um, but this idea of really these big water ideas um, that are still relating um, to the creek and, and to the watershed, but, um, but in, in this idea of, of starting conversations, um, but even um, helping to kind of frame those somewhat. So grown-ups don't need to have all the answers. You know, kids want to explain their ideas to you. Um, you know, conversation starter, when you drink a glass of water, how do you think your body uses it? What are the sounds you hear when it rains? Um, all of these things as, as really, you know, beautiful jumping off points. Um, and then we can go to the next one. So um, this is the, the crosswalk um, uh, uh, kind of concept. You can't really see it, but there are um, ones with just these, um, you know, kind of colorful water bubbles. And that's what they actually chose um, streets, um, the streets department. So we would work with, uh, a, a mural artist, uh, but we have yet to be determined in the next phase of work um, to do this. Uh, if we go to the next um, slide, um, one part that one one um, message that we heard loud and clear as well um, from the community is that most families um, have multiple age children. And so even though this is um, really targeting these three to five year olds, we also wanted to have something for the entire family and something that could be easily changed, something that TTF Watershed could really roll out as a, um, you know, a 21st century uh, um, 
almost like a, a you know a social media project that actually happens in real time in, in that it could um, have certain release dates and uh, but in this case um, how can we use um, something like water to relay messages and so we found this incredible water paint which you can paint on a surface and so these um, words that you see on the left hand side they're actually activated by water hitting that surface of the ground and so there's a walkway um, we can go back to in a minute that basically goes into the middle of the park and um, we're imagining painting that blue and then um, having this water poetry or water messaging which could also release um, uh, be the way that TTF Watershed releases new challenges to um, families and that they could alert the families of those challenges. So um, this water um, communication could actually be a way that um, TTF Watershed invites families to do something in the creek and these challenges could be to, um, I mean, they're across the board and, and that's something that we will work on in the next phase of work. Um, and one other thing that with the sculptures, if we can go back to that first um, uh, graphic, um, Dorian, with where we see everything, the bench and the sculpture. So we, like we were saying that we wanted things to be really grounded in the community. Um, the idea here is that we would have these six sculptures, the six benches, um, this um, rain art, that this rain communication, um, campaign um, all roll out, but that the kickoff would really be once all of these sculptures are installed, and then we would have a community art session where we would work with the community members with Jay Coriano and, um, you know, other support, um, other support staff that to actually create a art opportunity for families to participate in where we're creating a mosaic um, over the animal sculpture and at the end of this pdf we can show you some uh, other projects that we were really inspired by but the idea we haven't worked out all the specifics but um, the idea is that we would actually um, uh, have a multiple groups of teams community members working together um, hopefully on the same weekend, uh, basically finish the um, sculptures and, um, and that there would, you know, uh, it would culminate in a celebration of those sculptures being completed with the community. Um, and then that would be, um, you know, Julie's unveiling um, of this project overall to the public. And I, I think if you go to the very end, um, Dorian, we can see some of those um, reference images. Yeah, so these are um, our, our projects. We, we did a very extensive, which I'm happy to share with anyone who would like to see it, uh, very extensive public art um, benchmarking research um, phase uh, and, and looked at different things. And, and so there were some parameters um, because we, can't we couldn't have this be a permanent uh, installation um, and it needed to be removed. Um, so, there were things that we could do and couldn't do, but that benchmark document is really nice. And like I said, I'd be happy to share it with everyone um, to have a, as a point of reference. But these were the projects that really resonated with what we heard from the community and um, with um, you know TTF Watershed's uh, experiences in the community in the community in the neighborhood. I think I covered everything. Is that, did I miss anything, Dorian, Susan, Julie? Amazing. I think that was amazing. Oh, perfect. Um, I think you know what's really hard about working with Victoria is that she's not enthusiastic enough um, and doesn't mush enough into you know 15 minutes. Um, one of the things I just wanted to say, and then I think we just want to open up to questions, is um, this is you know this neighborhood is a neighborhood where we really um, have have developed roots. So um, along Cayuga Street, um, you know the there's a rain garden at one end that we maintain and that we helped get built. Um, and then at the other end, um, down the street is a connection, is the gateway to the park. All along the street are um, st green stormwater bump outs that the water department installed. And under the ball field, there's a big basin. So it's a soak it up site that we maintain. We help maintain those bump outs. So, you know, we're there. Um, and then as, um, I can't remember if Victoria said this or not, but the way the way we met Jay Coriano, 
our, uh, the artist is that he helped us design, we did a community cans project on this street and he helped us design the tops of those cans and those were painted by community members. Um, so, you know, we know a lot of people in this neighborhood, which makes it really nice. We're there a lot of the time. Um, and we hear a lot from families about additional, you know, stuff that they would like to see. We know there's a lot of kids in the neighborhood. It's a very active um, spot. And, you know, one of the challenges the city has that I think this is gonna help with in this area is that the parks are not connected to the recreation centers at all. There's no sort of programmatic or physical connection. Um, and this is an active recreation center right next to an urban watershed park um, that are just not connected in any way. So we're trying to make that happen. So yeah. I and one, one other thing, just so you know where things stand right now is um, we finished and summarized every, all of our work to date um, at the end of 2020. And, and then William, the William Penn Foundation wonderfully um, invited us to submit a proposal for the implementation phase, which is um, what we're going to be submitting on April 9th and that they really see, and that would take us to where we basically we, and we landed that vision of the five sculptures, the five benches, the multiple sets of signage, um, and you know the rain art and the two murals, um, the crosswalks. Uh, but they really see this as a. Um, they would love to see this as a beginning, as a pilot, and that they would love to see this continued and take on a different look and feel, perhaps even, um, but that still be connected with the learning trail. But that it could take on, uh, you know, it could be continued throughout the city in different locations, which would be wonderful. So we know that everyone's um, working on different projects and that things have been really hard for a lot of people over the last year. But we feel like once it's installed, hopefully, if we get the funding and it's installed, that it becomes, um, you know, a, a springboard for other people to learn from what we've gone through and then implement it and connect to the learning trail, um, you know, in the future. Thank you. So, um, uh, I think, I mean, there's not a lot of us on here. So I think if you have a question, um, jumped. Ellen has her hand raised because she's a teacher. So go for it, Ellen. Well, I want to just say it's uh, awesome as over you, but fantastic project. I love the integration of the, um, the arts and the literacy and the poetry of Beth Kephart and all of it is just any, you know, the natural world and everything. It's just really fantastic. And I can see it it will be su successful and I could see it being replicated across the um, watershed. So that's really exciting. Not in this, not replicated, but uh, you know, the model mm -hmm. the being used. But my question is, um, why did you um, decide on that age range? Was there a reason or um, what is the reason? Um, William Penn decided that. Okay, because that's their focus is, re yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Which was a great challenge, which I've never really focused just on that age group. And it's been, I've really loved it to be honest. I'm like, oh, we should do everything for that age group. But I know because we're working, you know, we're working with that age group on another William Penn funded, the literacy, the family literacy program. Right. And I can see some components of this. Are, we have to create something at um, our site um, after the third year of our, during the third year of our, um, our project. So I can see some mm -hmm. really great connections. So. Um, Oh, that would be great to connect. Yeah. And also, Ellen, if there's any way that some of the programming, I don't know if it could be mutually beneficial, but um, during this next phase, mm -hmm. Julie and Dorian and, and Susan will be working on those challenges. And I don't know if there's any way we could tie it to, the, to your curriculum, but there's lots Definitely. of them. Um, we have one young person, a family, uh, a young person who she's she's like nine years old, but she's a community organizer. And so yeah. she lives in the neighborhood by the teacher by the Taconi Creek. So if you need some advocates to spread yeah. the word, I'll connect you with um, with her. She is just a, a spitfire. So when you get to that, I'll that would to be connect great. her. That would be, please connect her with us. I was just gonna say, you know, it's, it's a, this is um, as someone who's had, um, as a mother, 
you know, this is was not my favorite age, um, but this is the, you know, it's a really important age. Um, we know how important this age is. So, you know, um, we're excited about that. Go ahead, Linda. Hi, so Victoria, this is fantastic. I think it's beautiful. Um, I wanna give you those a little perspective. I actually grew up in Longcrest and I still have a 90 year old aunt that lives on M Street two doors down from Cayuga. <laughs> so she is a little bit across the street. She doesn't get out as much anymore though. Um, the neighborhood's changed radically, like within 40 years. It's a very short turnaround when you think about it. Um, my question has to deal with something I struggle with. Um, I'm in Camden and you know, I'm on, I'm sometimes right there at the Delaware waterfront and kids think it's the ocean. Little kids think it's the ocean. And then when you go into Kramer Hill in North Camden, there are people that live literally two blocks from the river and do not know they live two blocks from a river. And so the question is, in this, are you, are you pushing the creek? Are you pushing river? Um, is, I mean, at some point, is there some attempt for, just for the adults to know that this creek leads to a river? I, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like, uh -huh. I feel like, you know, even living in a neighborhood in Philly, it, it's the same way. When I grew up, I lived near, um, by the way, Julie, I actually grew up in Longcrest, literally a block from Tookany Creek. Uh -huh. And then I lived in Cheltenham Village at Tookany Creek, right on at the end near the tennis courts there. So, but we don't ever consciously think of river and you know, your graphic, I know the one graphic, and you know, they're probably not complete and all, but it says river. So I'm just, you know, wondering, <laughs> you know, for people, is there something that will help put that into a context for them? But I love it. I mean, I love the interactive stuff. I love a graphic that encourages activity. I mean, that's what we did on the Camden side. Mm -hmm. and, and I would love to, you know, as the parks open over in, in Camden, I think we need to start talking about interpretation in some of those areas. So, you know, this is great. Yeah, I'm gonna, I was just going to say one thing and then let Victoria answer. I mean, that's our job, um, you know, is to connect people to their creeks. And we talk about creeks and we talk about rivers and we talk about the ocean. So, you know, every, we're just like you guys, you know, every opportunity we have to connect people to the inlet in front of their house and the creek down the street mm -hmm. and then the river. And you know it's challenging because these are neighborhoods that that don't have yep. um, creeks anymore, and and a very impaired creek system. Yep. So, so we're so Linda. Oh, uh, Ellen. Oh, I just want to say quickly, Linda. Doesn't this remind you of the day on the bridge in the Del when we did our WPI and we oh, were at yeah. and, and I know that Victoria, you we had these great hopes that we would bring together a traveling dialogue program with the Lions and talk about ways to connect to the creek in creative ways. And then we got shut down, but. Um. Yeah, Victoria, unfortunately you were not there. I think it would have been very energizing on the bridge. We took people out on the bridge and we just asked them to tell their story. You know, that everybody has a different story when, they, when they're standing there. And if you're gonna write a graphic or something for that, what is your story that you're gonna tell? So it was a really great conversation. But anyway, go ahead, you can. I, I love that. And, and Linda, it's so nice to see you. I feel like it's yeah. been eons. Um, so I know. Nice to see you. Um, so you're so spot on and we went through this. So, you know, of course this was like this journey because now if we're, we're trying to intersect people where they are. Well, we're intersecting with people where they are removes them from the creek. They can't see the creek. How are we going to deal with them? And, you know, so we did go through this, and and what our solution is, we hope, um, is going to be effective, is that we're using those two graphic panels. So one, the animal that's really helping you, you know, have some empathy, imagine, and these animals are all animals that you could possibly see. In, in in real life um, that you do see if you spend enough time there. So there are lots of layers of like how we made choices. Um, but in terms of your specific question, we took that watershed content and we decided very strategically and intentionally to say, okay, we're gonna make people just wonder about water. Like we're going to have mm -hmm. those signs be like this, these kind of like wondrous things about water. And then the activities are going to be the thing that brings you to the creek. So one of our, and, and those activities are things that um, Julie and her team can really shape so that you could be standing next to someone and you could have the difficult conversation of, oh, it's raining. 
what does that actually mean for this creek right here? Um, and, uh, and that's a very different thing than trying to tell that story on a sign that's uplifting and beautiful, um, but we don't, we don't you know, avoid it. It's just a different um, way of getting at it. And, and one of the things that Julie really wanted us to achieve, which I think we are, is, is that gateway. How are we getting people to, yes. um, you know, not be fearful of going into the creek? It's a wonderful place. And once you're there, you never think of that region of the city again in the same way. Um, and so having one at the gateway and then having those activities really be our, um, our way of engaging people directly with the creek um, is, is, is our strategy. Mm -hmm. So I love this. The images are beautiful. I can totally see dances to the songs. It's, it's wonderful and engaging. Let's do it everywhere. What is that price tag? So you've got two phases, you've got your implementation, you've got your, you know, the the year plus that, you know, it took planning, like ballpark figures. Well, our, I mean, our, so I'm so glad that you love it. And I would love for it to be everywhere too. So um, <laughs> let's have this be the first step. Let's make it happen. Um, and there's no, there's an endless well of hope. So yeah, I think we will. We're on the right, right on the path. So what, what I guess two things. The initial phase we did for very little money. It was one of William Penn's. Um, I guess they call it um, discovery grants or something. And and it was a seventy-two thousand dollar grant. And um, but in that we really did a lot of the work in terms of the engineering. You know, how can we really create these? Um, semi-permanent semi sculptures? How can we deal with um, some of the things that we can foresee? How can we deal with some of the roadblocks to having permanent art, which takes you know many, many years to get approved and, and all of that. So we did a lot of legwork um, and, cover, and then created construction documentation um, and so worked out a process. So in that case, and even designing the benches and those sorts of things. So that design work has been completed. In this next phase, um, we can share, I can share a budget with you, but, um, you know, we basically are looking at those six stations. One thing that William Penn really wanted to do was um, to also bring people to the River Alive exhibition. So they wanted to pay mm -hmm. for admission. So, and, and that's pretty expensive. I mean, $18 per ticket to get in um, there, William Penn's wanting to cover. So we've included all of that in our budgeting, including, um, uh, so getting, you know, we're estimating, or our goal would be to get 2,500 uh, people for a year in the door um, at River Life who wouldn't have otherwise possibly gone. Um, we're still getting all of this approved. You know, we have to get all this approved by William Penn. And, and so we we'll, might have some more to report. Um, but this phase in terms of all these components, um, you know, and the community art session, it's in the realm of 400,000. Um, it's that's the realm of it, and that doesn't we don't you know we're, we're the guinea pigs, and um, and like I said we're still refining some of that budgeting, um, and so we can have more of a detailed report, and we'd love to share it with you, Jamie. Um, and um, but that's I think the ballpark. So each one of those sculptures and bench systems, uh, it's quite expensive um, to do in a way that we can have it. Um, yeah, be custom and, and also movable. Right. right. And so also have those thousands upon <laughs> thousands of people use them over and over again. It's it's always interesting getting those numbers because I'm surprised, but I'm not at the same time that 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 that's the price tag. Um, but thank yeah. you for sharing that. And that also keeps it also puts in mind um, a 35,000, like some money for marketing and PR. I mean, there are other pieces to it um, that we're incorporating. And also William Penn had asked for us to have multiple signs that would focus on um, the different age groups specifically um, so that we could keep the signs much more whimsical. And so just a sign like that out in the public, just to give everyone a sense of the, that cost is $2,000. Um, so one of those circular um, graphic panels and one of those rectang rectangular graphic panels as a set is $2,000 alone. Right. I mean, I think one of the things that's 
um, I mean, I can't imagine there is any place more challenging in terms of bureaucracy to get anything done than the city of Philadelphia. Um, I mean, I'm not even gonna say I can't imagine, I know. So, um, so you know, we're doing this in a really hard place to get good things done, unfortunately. Um, and I think we've been very creative in order to make that happen. Um, so that's good because it's good to start with the hardest place maybe um, if you wanna do this in other places. You know, we have to make sure that things are really durable. We have to make sure that they're portable um, so that they're not permanent art installations. <laughs> um, if we were doing it that way, this would never happen. Um, and you know, this is one of the things, you know, this is this is Philadelphia Par Philadelphia Parks and Recreation property owned by the city, you know, owned by the people of Philadelphia, managed by Parks and Recreation. Um, and we are working in a space that is not our space, you know, it's not our landscape. Um, that said, we've gotten incredible response from Parks and Recreation um, and from the community. Um, you know, I think in the, you know, in this city, we see a lot of investment in center city um, neighborhoods. And, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why we're so interested in this is that we know that we're concerned about, I mean, we have a, as an organization, we have a concern about equity and park funding um, and what kind of stuff you get to see in center city that you don't see in neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, we're hoping that this will raise up um, and that funders like the William Penn Foundation and the, you know, the Fairmont Park Conservancy and Knight Foundation, that they'll see this as something that's really valuable and doable in other places as well. Well, and also one, one, one thing to add to what Julie's saying is that um, if we had these repeated, these animals, so one, one way that you could do this, of course, much less um, at a lower cost would be to use sculptures that already exist. But we really wanted these to be water sculptures. We wanted them to re react to the rain. We wanted them to react to, you know, buckets of water. I mean, I, my niece would have spent, you know, her whole days doing this kind of activity. So, but we wanted the sculptures to be special. But now that they've been designed and now that we even have the construction documentation, it would really be just the cost of fabricating it. So again, Jamie, like there would be ways of really reducing the overall cost if it wasn't, new animals or, you know, if we weren't redesigning it. Um, so there could be a, a, a second budget that we could create um, that would be, you know, how could this be replicated? Um, and the stories could be expanded. So even if the sculptures are our same beautiful sculptures and our fish and our fox and, you know, all of these wonderful characters that now we're creating this urban narrative of storytelling and playfulness and dancing and singing, um, that the story could be continued in each location. So the Fox song could be continued, um, you know, uh, in the next installation. So I know we're close to out of time. I'm curious as to the, like the evaluation component, like how are you going to show that this is an absolutely brilliant idea and this is why you know, all of these other foundations should fund projects just like this. Well, it's a, it's a, in the next phase of work, it's a good question because one of our goal, so we have two goals. One is to get families back in Juniata Park and interacting with these components. So there will be an, I think, an observational kind of assessment that um, TTF Watershed will be able to do um, because we know that they're not using the parks and that that is our goal is that these um, uh, components um, will it be an invitation. Um, second, secondly, is that at the third, at the final, at the um, gateway, um, uh, installation, that's when people are going to be able to create um, an opportunity to go to the River Live exhibition. So that's where you can do a selfie. And so there will be social media, um, you know, uh, interactivity that we can assess and follow and, and actually be able to say, you know, did we meet our goal? Did we get 2,500 people to go into a River Alive? And then the third piece would be um, the families that are participating in 
um, the challenges. That's something, these are all things that um, TTF Watershed can really log. And we have the benchmark. We know that they aren't using the park. Um, and we also can look at, um, you know, um, visitorship um, at the Seaport Museum. And, and so I think those are the three ways that um, off the bat we can, um, you know, start to create a system where TTF Watershed can really see what is the impact of this work. I mean, in so much of it, it's hard to gauge, you know, um, joy and wonder and, and play, but there are ways that we can um, document and calculate, um, you know, the people who are interacting. And, and with Susan and Dorian and the TTF Watershed team, they're very present in this neighborhood, which was another reason why I agreed to do this project. I wouldn't have done this project with an organization that that doesn't have an on the ground presence because it won't work. Um, challenges, um, this kind of interactivity, um, you, need, you need TTF Watershed to be there and engaging. And, um, and so uh, there will be, I think, lots of observational data that can be collected. Uh, Julie, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that or if that answers your question, Jeannie. Um, it it does. Uh, God bless you, TTF. I you know do doing evaluation is always that really time consuming and intensive uh, part of projects that often don't get mm -hmm. funded, which is usually necessary to pull off a good eval. Hopefully, the um, you know access to two roads can be of some assistance mm -hmm. in in helping getting this. Uh, you know, done it and documented and, and then shared. So, you know, right. let's continue to, to talk to see how we can, you know, actually make it a solid, you know, what is it, home run or touchdown or yes. whatever. One of those <laughs> things. Or you like. <laughs> One of those things. It's so funny. This, everyone on this, this is a woman. We didn't make, mean to make this a woman only call, but um, it's, you know, that's okay with me. It's, um, that was a really good question. And we think about that a lot. And no, you know, if those things can in some ways cost money. I mean, we always would love to do, be doing surveys and looking at pre and post and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we do, there are some ways that we'll be able to measure like, like Victoria said, with the number of people who go to the Seaport Museum, we also are gonna be, we just got some trail counters um, and we're going to be able to measure increases in trail use. Um, and this makes sense to have a trail counter at that gateway, um, you know, potentially to see when this thing goes in, are we getting more people to go into the, you know, to go in there. Um, so that's, yeah, so, you know, we love to, we always talk about evaluation and how we need to do a better job. Um, so Victoria, I think we're good. I think what we, we are so appreciate people taking the time I think it's so nice that you guys aren't eating lunch in front of us. Maybe <laughs> Patricia and Sarah are smart and they are, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's sort of why we did this at lunchtime because to me, you're gonna be sitting eating anyway. You might as well go to a meeting. Um, if you have, you have Dorian and Susan's emails. So if you have any other thoughts, please send them to us. So we know what you're thinking um, and we'll keep you posted on how this, how this moves forward. Um, is that it, Victoria? The one other thing I was, yeah, I think that's it. That's all I have. Yeah, and just if there's any documentation that anyone would um, would like to see personally, I mean, we, we're, we would love to share it. So um, like, like I said, we're, we're trying to do a lot of the groundwork so that this can be, um, you know, contagious. Contagious in a positive way. We're, 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 we're changing the narrative across the board. Well, you know, viral also has a positive <laughs> connotation-ish these days. <laughs> positive social media, negative COVID. So it's, uh... Yes. Yeah. So just let us know. Um, but thanks, everybody. Great to see so many of you, familiar faces. Thank you.